I would like to extend a warm welcome to every one of you here and uh, I would uh, request now our Dean of uh, School of Medical Sciences to introduce the details of School of Medical Sciences. Just before that one minute I will take, I have uh, not mentioned about University of Hyderabad for those who have come from other places. University of Hyderabad is one of the top ranking institutions in the country today and we also have made our presence in the world ranking in the last two to three years. And by all means, University of Hyderabad has proved in its uh, 45 years of existence as one of the best institutions in the country. And we have a distinction as uh, the top, in the top 100 of the, world, of the world as youngest universities which are growing fast. That's the recognition that this university has. And we have 12 schools of study and today the School of Medical Sciences is coordinating this event. Therefore, I request Professor Prakash Babu, the in charge dean of School of Medical Sciences to brief about the School of Medical Sciences and then Professor Shamana will introduce, to, introduce the guest to all the audience. Professor Prakash. Very good afternoon, all of you, respected Vice Chancellor, and today's the speaker, so Professor Peter, and the invited guests, guests in the audience, uh, my colleague uh, Professor Arun Agarwal, Professor uh, uh, <coughs> Basubramanian Garu, my colleagues in the Dias and Murti Garu, and IRD officials, students, invited guests to this lecture series. It's my pleasure to introduce the School of Medical Sciences. It's one of the 12 schools as our Vice Chancellor indicated. This is one of the youngest schools that uh, they created in the university. This is running the few programs. One is the Optometry, Master of Public Health, and we have the associated centers like uh, Center for Cognitive and Neural Science. The part that we are dealing with is we have the biomedical sciences where the research is going on actually in the biomedics and my colleague uh, Professor Kieta is here. And also the we have the interdisciplinary course, one uh, with the optometry with five years integrated uh, program. Students will be taken after uh, plus two and they will be trained and they will be given graduation, the post graduation. And uh, another important course that we are running is the Master of Public Health which is in a interdisciplinary course between the life sciences and also the social sciences. And the students are taken across the various disciplines. This is basically to cater the need of the public. And as we know the bench to bedside research, what are we, have done, we are doing in the laboratory should be translated to the treatment. But whereas the MPH is concentrating on the bedside to the social, it's a, it goes to the society. So for which the School of Medical Sciences, especially the MPH, is making a lot of its sincere efforts in taking the message to the public. As you know, the India is a culturally, socially and economically diverse population. It is not so easy to take the message across the people. And this is the, our public health faculty and the students are working hard to promote the public health research and also to create the leadership wherein they can introduce the how the public health is very much important, how the measures can be taken even before that. So this is basically to not only the, the teaching and also the research and also training the people to take care such a kind of epidemics or incidents are happen. So our faculty are across the divisions that they are concentrating on the various research topic which are very much public health related. With these few words, I thank the organizers and I thank the IHM uh, 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 people, those who are only here, and I uh, thank everybody for the opportunity given for the School of Life Sciences. I congratulate Professor Shamana for the initiation. Thank you very much. Uh, the Vice Chancellor, distinguished uh, speaker today, Professor Pat, Hedy, uh, Chairman IRDA, 
Mr. Subhash Chandra Kuntia and esteemed members, uh, members of the steering committee of this uh, lecture series, invited institutional heads, scholars, students, press, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the onerous task of uh, introducing the distinguished guest speaker with so many credentials and credits is probably more difficult than delivering a lecture in the classroom. So, but I will true and try and do my best with what's called as a shark tank presentation for about three to five, four minutes. Uh, if you look at, uh, cursorily, if you had had a chance to look at the newspaper today, two headlines, probably contrasting headlines, uh, you know, hits you in your face. One is, it says, drug resistant TB amenable to shorter treatment time with a new regimen. So the 20 month regimen is further shortened to about six months with a similar regimen than what it is uh, in Oak today. Uh, the next headline, contrasting headline and probably should raise our hackles is the fact that uh, there has been what is called as emergence of West Nile virus disease in Kerala. We have never heard about West Nile virus in this country and hence uh, listening to something like a West Nile virus disease and its emergence in Kerala is something which is very contextual with what our speaker today will talk to us about and for all, those of you who followed history of public health, when I say history and history of public health, uh, the topic today is about uh, 100 years after the Spanish flu and the name Spanish flu also is something which the speaker will allude to today. And uh, you know, uh, are we ready for the next epidemic? Because uh, uh, I don't want to steal his thunder, but just to tell you that uh, Spanish to Spanish flu uh, led to a lot of mortality. About 500 million people across the globe in 1990 were affected, and about three to five percent of the population died because of Spanish flu. And this was a pandemic because it was all across the world, and even extended to places like Arctic uh, region and the coldermost regions of this country. So I think that is the context with which uh, we have this distinguished speaker and who better to talk about this than Professor Peter Pai. Uh, like our uh, Vice Chancellor mentioned, mentioned, unique combination of having a uh, clinician as well as a microbiologist, but I'll go one step further uh, and tell he's also been a polit public health activist and also been a dip diplomat, meaning that for 15 long years, he has been Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and was the first founding director of uh, global UNAIDS. And uh, probably as part of his uh, UNAIDS, I guess uh, it should be noted that, uh, uh, you know, he took his skills as scientist, manager, diplomat and activist and challenged world leaders across the world to actually you know, view AIDS in the context of social and economic development as well as security needs. I think that is very, very important for us to look at when we look at uh, uh, what Peter has done and how does it, you know, what his topic of today, how does it actually influence a broader agenda rather than being restricted to something related to only health. Uh, at the moment, Peter is the director of London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a Handa Professor of Global Health. He's been the first chair of what's called as Her Majesty's Government Strategic Coherence of Overseas Development Assisted Funded Research or Scoreboard, the Vice Chair of the Board of the Global Health Innovative Technology Fund in Tokyo, Vice Chair of the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, Chair of the Global Burden of Disease Independent Advisory Committee and Chair of King Bedouin Foundation United States. He is the member of the Board for African Health Research Institute in Durban and Public Health Foundation of India and member of the Oxford Martin Commission on Future Generations. I don't want to eat into his time by actually presenting all his credentials, but just to let you know that uh, apart from his phenomenal work in co-discovering the Ebola virus and spearheading and providing leadership and stewardship to the UNAIDS program, uh, he, he has been involved in actually global public health and you know in a very big way. Uh, like he said, he has uh, had his medical degree from the University of Ghent, he is Flemish or he is from Belgium and a PhD in microbiology from University of Antwerp and also has worked extensively mostly on sexually transmitted diseases and women's health in sub-Saharan Africa and has held very much major positions, both academic and professional, 
and also been a senior fellow of the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation. And uh, in 2009-2010, he did have or he did hold a position called as Knowledge Against Poverty at the Collège de France in Paris. He was also the visiting professor to the London School of Economics. I can go on and on, but uh, I, I would just mention a few of his awards. The Canadian Gardner Global Health Award, Robert Koch Gold Medal, Prix International, INSA Medal in Paris. He was 2014 Time Person of the Year for the Ebola Fighters and received the Prince Maidol Award for Public Health. In 2013, he was laureate of the Hideo Nagochi Africa Prize for Medical Research. He received the Thomas Paran Award from ASTA, the Nelson Mandela Award for Health and Human Rights in 2001, the Frank A. Calderon Prize in Public Health in 2003, the Manson Medal, the Bloomberg Hopkins Award in 2016. He was uh, knighted as a baron in 1995 in his native Belgium and awarded the honor in a knighthood KCMG in 2016. Uh, he's also been the board member of the Novartis Foundation, Board of Trustees since 2015. Just to conclude, he has published over 600 scientific articles and close to 20 books, including his memoir, No Time to Lose, in 2012. It's translated into French, Dutch, Japanese, and Korean and AIDS between science and politics in 19, uh, 2015 by the Columbia University Press. I present before you, Baron Professor Peter Pat. Thank you very much, Sasham, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Vice Chancellor Aparao and uh, Dean Prakash Babu. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be Back in Hyderabad, I've been here, I think, probably five times uh, in my life, starting in the 90s, and I must say that things have changed enormously, and for good. But it's the first time I'm here at the uh, University of Hyderabad, and so thank you for the invitation, for the honor, and also congratulations on your achievements, um, because there are quite many, including in uh, the field here in uh, life sciences. And uh, I had the opportunity of the last uh, few days to meet members of the government and the administration of the state, uh, for business also, um, particularly in uh, life sciences and uh, pharma and um, biotech, and also, um, of course, working with the Indian Institute for Public Health, uh, led by Professor G.V.S. Murthy. So I feel that uh, um, this is a, uh, an environment uh, and Hyderabad has a, an incredible future. Um, and visiting, uh, and I'll certainly be interested in uh, in coming back. Now, when I was invited uh, to um, this uh, prestigious lecture, I was thinking, what can I speak about? Because there are many uh, interesting things going on in the world. But then I thought, this is a um, the 100th anniversary of the Spanish flu. And uh, let's see, um, yeah. And it's a little known fact that uh, India was probably the country that was most affected by the Spanish flu. It is um, the largest uh, epidemic, a pandemic. Pandemic means a, that an epidemic that encompasses the whole world. Um, of the last, uh, well, of the last century and up to now, and uh, only the AIDS epidemic, and I'll say a few words about that, is coming close. Um, and as we heard, it killed between 50 and 100 million people in the world. And this is from, uh, you know, the um, um, some of the facts, or the it has an impact on uh, even on the literature in uh, in India here with the. The uh, Nirala, who recalls the uh, flu uh, epidemic in his memoir, and it's uh, quite dramatic, quite dramatic in the sense that you can see, you can read there, but um, you can see the Ganga was uh, swollen with dead bodies. At my in law house, I learned that my wife had passed away. My family disappeared in the blink of an eye. In whichever direction I turned, I saw darkness. 
So this you can read in far more detail in, um, you know, A Life Misspent by the famous uh, writer uh, we call Nirala. And these stories are, you know, over and over again um, can be found in about every country in the world. And killing famous scientists, not so famous scientists, artists, writers, painters, and so on, and many people. And the epidemic came in three waves, three big waves. Um, first in the spring in 1918, and then uh, again, uh, it's spring, this is the European spring, I must say. Um, and the third wave was uh, happening around uh, this time and hitting uh, India in a big way. Now, in epidemics and disasters, usually one blames the others, other countries. And this, for, to be, make it very clear, the Spanish flu has nothing to do with Spain. But this happened um, during the big war, World War I, and uh, at the end of it, and uh, uh, the countries that were parties to the war had very severe uh, censorship and it was not allowed to mention any bad news. Certainly not any military bad news, but also other bad news. Spain was not part of the, um, the war effort, or the, if I can say so. And, uh, and there there was uh, in the media what they were talking about, this uh, deadly disease, this pandemic. And, uh, and in Spain they were blaming it on Italy, on Napoli. And, uh, and so every country was blaming another country. Um, which, frankly, unfortunately, humanity doesn't seem to have uh, uh, evolved. But uh, hence it became the Spanish flu because they were the only ones talking about it. But it is so that the first cases appeared in the United States, in some military camps in Kansas, in the middle of the, of the US, um, which is a bit uh, different from um, usually the uh, influenza, the, the, the flu, viruses they come and emerge in uh, in China so you see this is a virus that um, spread all over the world at a time when there was no commercial airfare uh, uh, airlines there was no you know the the fastest way of traveling was were the railways but not many uh, countries had uh, a large network of railways actually none um, by uh, 1918. And so that's what I find certainly remarkable uh, when you compare with today's world where millions of people take the plane every single day uh, going from one uh, place of the world to the other side of the world but then this virus has the capacity to spread by what we consider today fairly slow uh, transport. Um, and. Um, when you look here at India, so the, uh, it's now estimated that between 10 and 20 million Indians lost their life in one single epidemic. That at a time when the population of India, of course, was much, much smaller. We were talking about a few hundred million people only. And, um, and you can see it was a, of a patchy uh, type of spread, particularly in the western part and the southern part of the country. So, including uh, here in Hyderabad, and uh, you can see here the um, these are the um, death rates in what was called in Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta, um, and uh, you can say there's a big range between 10, uh, 10 and 20 million, but that's because statistics were not that that great. Now, the this epidemic had um, major impact also long-term impact. First of all, the immediate uh, economic impact was huge uh, in terms of uh, lost production. Um, also, the, this epidemic was killing young adults. So the, um, the really the uh, most productive members of society. Um, but it led also to, I mean, many children were orphaned. Millions and millions of children, you know, when you have at a time when you know, people had lots of children. When you have between 50 and 100 million people who die, that leaves behind tens of millions of orphans. Um, but on the positive side, I would say the, we saw an expansion of medical research. 
people said, well, let's not forget, in these days there were no vaccines against the influenza, so there was no treatment. Um, it was not even clear what the origin was, the cause, uh, and how it was transmitted. So this epidemic led to major investments um, of, uh, in medical research all over the world, including here in, uh, in India. And also, uh, there was a, um, the st start, I would say, of um, the realization that governments have responsibility for health and for public health. That health is not just a, an individual issue for the person, of course it is, but also it is to the benefit of the, popul of the society as a whole if people are healthy, if we can control epidemics and so on. So that's the uh, insurance policy uh, that the state has to provide so that we are protected. Hence, for example, the major um, immunization vaccination programs that save and have been saving millions and millions of lives each year um, and, uh, and that are uh, supported by uh, public money by the state. Um, also interesting that some um, this epidemic led to some societal changes also in terms of behavior. Um, for all those of you who have been to Japan, you know that when in Japan you have a cough or a cold, people cover their mouth with a, with a mask. That started in that epidemic. Here you see a group of Japanese girls during the... This is not to protect themselves, that was the originally, to protect... But in Japan, people want to protect others by wearing that mask. Um, and then, uh, was recently in Hong Kong, and in Hong Kong, there was um, a few years, uh, in 2003, and I'll come back to that, a big epidemic of SARS, I'll, I'll talk about that, which is transmitted also, like flu, respiratory mode of transmission. And before SARS, people uh, would use one pair of chopsticks to uh, pick the food from the, uh, you know, the common plate. Today, they're using two pairs, one to put the food from the center and then the plate, on their plate, you know, and then the other one to eat. That was induced by the epidemic. So we have cultural changes uh, as well. Now, oh. now, epidemics have always been with us. It's part of the human condition. And even if you see here, for the last uh, 100 years, we have the, uh, the Spanish flu. And then, as I mentioned, the other big epidemic is uh, HIV or the AIDS epidemic, which started in uh, or was revealed in 1981 uh, and, in, and cumulatively now has caused the death of well over 30 million people. So it's going to uh, uh, at this page where um, about 1 million people still die from AIDS in the world every single year. Um, in a few years' time, we will be close to the death toll of the Spanish flu. But it is the um, different forms of influenza, of this uh, influenza virus, that periodically cause uh, an epidemic. And um, they get a names like Hong Kong flu, or Asian flu, or Russian flu, uh, swine flu, avian flu. Uh, these terminologies are usually not that very ac accurate. What matters, and the reason that we have these epidemics, is that the virus that causes influenza, influenza virus, is a very volatile virus that mutates all the time. And it mutates sometimes um, mildly and sometimes dramatically. If it mutates completely different in a, and, and turns into a different virus in terms of the outer coat and some of the uh, elements uh, that are characterized by H and N, neuraminidase and hemoglobin, then um, we have no protection, no antibodies. Our, our body does not have any memory of previous exposure and then you can have like a, uh, a massive uh, epidemic in the world. So this is uh, what will come back again um, one day um, and uh, when we don't know. Now, when you look at it from a societal perspective and an economic perspective, um, and when we look at risks in society, and then I'm very grateful for that this uh, um, lecture series is um, sponsored by insurance um, you know, sector and um, insurance is about risk and uh, here this is uh, the World Economic Forum every year the, the, you know the ones that organize the famous meeting in Davos in Switzerland um, 
and uh, the World Economic Forum in its, uh, every year in its report tries to assess what are the big risks in the world. And for the last 10, 20 years, epidemics are on there. <coughs> epidemics are on there, and they're part of the big risks, together with um, a um, meltdown of the economy, uh, climate change, um, you know, um, trade war, and all that. So that's, um, that's one thing to, to, to keep in mind. Secondly, the economic costs are formidable. That depends, of course, where it happens and what. But if you look here, this is for the last uh, 20 um, years, more or less, um, we see what have been the cost of uh, epidemics. These are influenza epidemics. Here you see, uh, I can't fully re read it, but this is the time. But you can see we're talking about uh, billions of, um, so many, many thousands of crores uh, uh, of um, economic costs for these particular societies, but sometimes also far away um, from where the original epidemic is. Now, before talking about are we ready, the next epidemic, let me briefly mention a few of the epidemics that have been occurring. Uh, in uh, this century, and uh, because they, each of them represents some uh, some particular aspect. <coughs> um, the first uh, big epidemic or new epidemic was uh, called SARS, and that stands for um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, some abbreviation. And that hit uh, Eastern China, Southeast China, and Hong Kong particularly. And it, uh, uh, you can see here, it killed, this was in, in 2003, in the beginning of the year, uh, in a few months' time, um, you know, uh, it, it was responsible for 3,500 cases and killed several hundreds of people. Now, what is particular there is that um, it caused some panic because it was a new virus, we didn't know where it came from, um, and um, it hit the, uh, the headlines here. But what's important to know is that when, whereas most of the cases uh, occurred in Hong Kong, you can see here, and in uh, China, but China's big, but Hong Kong overpopulated, densely populated, uh, spread of um, the virus uh, in apartment buildings and a hotel and so on. But one of the things that happened is that a, uh, a businessman flew from Hong Kong to Toronto, here in, the, in Canada, and in Toronto uh, gave rise then to uh, about over 100 uh, cases, of whom about 30 died. So that's the difference with the world uh, uh, 100 years ago, that you can, you know, you can have a problem today, and, you know, take Hyderabad, you have an international airport, you can fly from all over, and, uh, you know, someone can, can arrive here or the other way around and uh, come uh, with a new virus. Uh, something similar happened with um, another new virus, which is called MERS. MERS stands for Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. This is a virus of the same family. Um, coronavirus, for those who are, are into uh, virology, uh, coronavirus, um, it, and uh, it's a virus that um, the, the, the host that it, from, which, from whom um, people are infected are camels. It, 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 it's occurring particularly in the Gulf where there are lots of camels, uh, but lots of connections with, uh, with India, particularly with the western and southern part of the country. And here also, again, one day, a businessman flew from Abu Dhabi to Seoul, to Korea. And um, this is what happened. One person went from, first of all, from one medical center to another because he didn't feel well. He felt that he was not well uh, treated in one center, so and did some what's called a medical shopping in Korea. And, um, and then infected through coughing. Uh, lots of people, causing about 50 deaths. And uh, it was also, uh, 
in the intensive care units of the uh, of these hospitals that a lot of transmission was occurring. And indeed, in many of these these viruses, it's the healthcare workers that are the the first line of uh, attack. Third epidemic this uh, um, this century that was new was an uh, epidemic of the so-called Zika virus. Um, and uh, you're welcome to stay, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, um, the um, Zika is a virus that was discovered in 1947 in Uganda, a country in East Africa. Here, by the way, it's uh, by the Uganda Virus Research Institute, which is part uh, the Medical Research Council in, uh, unit there, part of the um, uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, this was a virus that was a virus without a disease and looking for a, because there are many viruses that don't cause disease. We don't know. Uh, certainly no disease in humans. And, um, and it was uh, detected here and there in the world. Um, and, and, um, and it was uh, detected here and there in the world. Um, and um, we, um, you know, uh, even some cases in Pakistan in 83, but without any clinical significance until there was a big epidemic in Brazil, in Brazil when hundreds of thousands of people were infected with Zika virus. Zika is the name of a forest in Uganda that gave the name. <coughs> and what it did was uh, something very sad in Brazil, and that is that if you're pregnant and you're infected with Zika virus, particularly during the first trimester, uh, your uh, baby um, will have very severe neurological syndromes, including what's called microcephaly, in other words, a small head. Um, and um, this is, uh, gave rise to a, a very, very dramatic uh, epidemic. But here we have a completely different type of virus. The previous viruses were transmitted through, you know, are airborne, and you can catch on the bus to say so, or so you're in an elevator with someone. Um, but here it is in the same category as um, viruses like dengue, uh, which are, um, you know, affecting um, this part of the uh, of the country quite regularly. <coughs> Epidemic zone. This is an old uh, slide, but um, um, the whole world now is affected by dengue, and it is uh, um, these are viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes. And in the case of uh, Zika, Dengue, Chikungunya, there are cases now also here in India, um, of uh, yellow fever, they're all transmitted by a mosquito called um, Aedes aegypti. And Aedes is a tiny mosquito, and uh, you can see where it's distributed over the world. And because of climate change, an increase of the uh, temperature, this um, mosquito now is spreading um, more and more also in areas that uh, until recently uh, were not uh, part of their natural habitat. And so here you see how um, climate change um, is not only uh, affecting uh, the environment, uh, agricultural production um, produces heat waves with mortality and so on, uh, increases pollution but also will affect the spread of um, infectious diseases, particularly those that are uh, spread by uh, mosquitoes. Um, and then a virus that probably very few have heard of, but, um, and that has not caused big epidemics, but is of relevance here in, uh, uh, you know, here in India at least, and that is so-called Nipah virus, first recognized uh, about 20 years ago in Malaysia among pig farmers, because pigs were the source of it, but it's actually another virus that is uh, uh, living peacefully, to say so, in bats. Um, there have been periodic cases in, um, in this part of, uh, uh, of, the, of the, the country, but uh, last year in Kerala, uh, that got quite some attention, there were 17 deaths from this virus. No treatment, no vaccine, but now the good news is, and I'll come back to that, we, there is uh, now a, um, a research effort funded by uh, a new institution called CEPI. 
So these are some of the viruses that uh, this century have caught the attention, uh, besides influenza virus, which, by the way, kills every year uh, a few hundred thousand people, even without uh, uh, being, causing an epidemic. Now, as you heard, I, um, the first uh, epidemic I was um, kind of involved in was by the Ebola virus. Um, it was in 1976. Um, when I was uh, just graduated from medical school and was in training in virology and microbiology, infectious diseases, and um, our lab, I was then working in Antwerp at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, we isolated a virus that looked like this, uh, more like a spaghetti or a worm, you know, viruses usually are spheres or square type of, uh, um, you know, things uh, under the electron microscope. But this is what, uh, what we saw, and um, it was the cause of a, uh, an epidemic uh, that was going on in what was then called Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Central Africa. And um, we, we named the virus, the, the virus was identified as something new by uh, scientists at the uh, American Centers for Disease Control in um, Atlanta because we were uh, once we saw what this was, uh, we thought it was another, related to another virus, Marburg, and we had to immediately stop all research with it because you're only allowed to work with these viruses in so-called BSL-4 uh, environment. These are uh, very special laboratories where people uh, operate in, with, in spacesuits and so on to protect themselves and the environment from contamination. And uh, we call the virus after a, a, the Ebola River. Ebola is a river that's uh, in central, flowing in central um, Congo, uh, not too far from where the epidemiological, the epidemic center was of this epidemic. And we, we protected ourselves. There's a colleague from Institut Pasteur, a picture I took in '76, and where we were investigating the epidemic. And uh, our goal was to, first of all, to figure out how is this virus transmitted. Because if you confront it with an epidemic, uh, the most important thing to know is what is the cause of it and how is it transmitted. Is this foodborne? Is this the air? Is this sex? Is this blood? Uh, are these mosquitoes? Uh, close contact, etc. The, the classic ways of uh, spread of a microorganism. Uh, because as long as you don't know the mode of transmission, you can't really put in place um, you know, rational measures to stop the spread. So that was our biggest concern, and uh, uh, can we find that out when it's a completely new virus? Um, and, uh, but we found out in, uh, pretty rapidly that what was required is very close contact. And by the way, this is how today, this was in, uh, in West Africa, how uh, you know, healthcare workers are dressed uh, with full protection compared to uh, in 76. And one of the reasons is that it is, uh, I'm not concerned for big Ebola outbreaks in the world and spread, but it can be very bad locally and particularly for the family members and for healthcare workers. Why? Because you need close contact with, um, you know, the body secretions for someone with Ebola. And when you have Ebola virus infection, um, you know, the, um, you are uh, you vomit, you have diarrhea, you bleed, and so that's how uh, other people become infected. And in um, 2014 and later, uh, Ebola caused the largest epidemic ever with um, um, 11,000 deaths, 11,000 deaths of 17,000 people infected, including 500 healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, in countries in West Africa that had already a major shortage of uh, healthcare workers. For example, Liberia, uh, a country of about 5 million people, uh, so much smaller than Hyderabad in terms of population, but they only had 51 registered physicians. And, um, and of those, several have died while caring for, uh, for patients. Um, but so, since 76, there were several uh, outbreaks, particularly here in the Democratic Republic of Congo and the neighboring countries. Um, and 
And so it was thought, okay, this is something that only occurs in Central Africa. But it changed all, uh, it changed in 2014. And uh, we thought it was uh, limited to Central Africa because this is a, um, a virus that is coming from bats. Also, just as uh, I mentioned for Nipah and for uh, also for uh, SARS. And that this bat would also only occur in West Africa, in, in Central Africa. But it's clearly that we were mistaken. It took, therefore, several months uh, between the first case, which uh, occurred in December 2013 in Guinea, at the border town with the two other countries, Liberia and Sierra Leone, and the beginning of March 2018, so more than three months, uh, no, two and a half months, um, you know, uh, delay in terms of diagnosing. And in the meantime, the, the virus spread. Uh, and the reason was that one, you only can find what you're looking for, and nobody was looking for Ebola in West Africa. And two, um, these are countries, two came out of civil war, another one, um, Guinea, out of uh, decades of corrupt dictatorship. So professionals had left the country, and there was no or hardly any infrastructure. So, so this is a, um, what's now going on. Um, so, and then what, what happened is that um, the epidemic was not only uh, killing people, of course, uh, commerce came to a halt, agriculture came to a halt, schools were closed, universities were closed for two years, imagine. Um, and, um, but also there was a lot of societal in unrest. People did not trust what the government was saying, uh, they killed um, nurses, they killed journalists, um, and um, particularly if you ima can imagine that you come as a society out of a decade of civil war where people were killing each other because of different opinions or because they had different ethnic origin, um, you don't restore confidence and trust in the state uh, overnight. So when the government said we has there is an epidemic, we have to isolate certain people, isolate uh, entire villages and so on, um, the reaction was this must be a political thing. Um, so it illustrates how uh, epidemics are uh, having an impact and effect um, a um, society as a whole. The good news, the silver lining on this 2014 big epidemic in West Africa was that um, for the first time there was some research was being done we could demonstrate in uh, you know, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. We were um, you know, involved in uh, a lot of research. One that demonstrated that uh, a vaccine that's produced by um, the company Merck, um, Merck Sharp and Dome, that, that protects against um, this uh, Ebola virus infection. And another one that's uh, produced by Janssen from Johnson & Johnson that's also producing. It's a different times was also therapeutic research, but that didn't show any uh, positive results as yet. Now, at the moment, what keeps me very busy um, is uh, the second largest outbreak of Ebola uh, in the world, in, in, as far as we know, and it's occurring now once again in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in, in the eastern part. When you see here, this, uh, um, you know, this is a, the border with, uh, here is Africa, so it's in the center of Africa. Um, and this is a lake that uh, makes up the border with Uganda in, in East Africa. And you have also uh, Rwanda here. So here we've got now, um, as of uh, two days ago, we had 927 cases were um, reported with 584 deaths um, in a relatively small area with the case fatality ratio of 63%. That's very high. Um, the problem is that the epidemic is getting out of control. And the reason for that is in the first place because it's a conflict zone. This part of the world is the richest part in terms of uh, Coltrane. Coltrane is a pressure and metal that you find in about every single mobile phone, just like cobalt. And DRC, Congo, is also the main producer in the world of cobalt. About 40% all cobalt comes from there. Now, that's not only a blessing, but also a curse in the country. Because 
armed group are trying to control the mines, there are conflicts, uh, also a, uh, still a spillover from the genocide in Rwanda, spillover from uh, civil war in DRC. So how do you control an epidemic where the basis um, isolating uh, patients, uh, contact tracing, trying to find who uh, in contact, try to vaccinate people when, you know, there are armed groups that shoot at you. Um, yesterday, again, um, you know, a, um, some militia um, attacked vaccinators because we're using the vaccine. And uh, over the last two weeks, three Ebola treatment centers have been burned down. One by a militia, two by the community. Um, so that is a, a major problem. And that means then that um, half of the cases uh, pop up like this and we don't know whether they're part of a transmission chain. In other words, you know, if you know that I have Ebola, but that um, I have Ebola because my cousin or so has it and I was in contact with that, that makes it quite easy to contain them. But if uh, I come up with Ebola and there's no uh, any indication with whom I've had contact and so on, that's a problem. Um, major uh, mistrust of community. And for example, there were uh, presidential elections in, um, uh, in DRC a few months ago. And because of the Ebola outbreak, the, the government said that citizens from that part of the country could not vote. Now, that part of the country happens to be also uh, a majority for the opposition. So, um, you know, that's the, all these kind of things come together. Nothing to do with public health uh, or with medicine. Uh, we have, it's a border area, and when violence uh, is really bad, then people uh, fly and, and uh, run away to, uh, to Uganda. So the neighboring countries are very worried also. And um, we have at the same time there's now cholera, there's even plague and malaria. And here you can see, uh, this is Dr. Tedros, the Director General of the World Health Organization. Uh, and here is uh, Dr. Jeremy Farr, the Director of the Wellcome Trust, who spent their New, Year, New Year's Day in um, you know, a treatment center uh, in that area to show not only solidarity, but that this is being taken seriously. So Ebola continues, as I said, it is headlines, um, it's, uh, um, it's really very bad when it happens in your community. And um, I would say for India, I, don't, I would not be too worried. I would be worried about MERS, about SARS, about dengue, about chikungunya and so on. Um, but for those of you, if there are anybody working in intensive care units or so, it's not a patient that um, of whom you know that they have one of these diseases that are the problems. The problems are patients you don't know. And, uh, and they could then, you know, infect um, all the staff and so on. Now, as I mentioned, the, 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 after the Spanish flu, the biggest epidemic of our time is the AIDS epidemic. I won't go into much detail. Here, the good news is that um, something, an, a new virus that came out of the blue and was, uh, uh, you know, detected. The syndrome was only detected in, in 1981. Virus discovered in 1983 and was, uh, a Nobel Prize was given for those who found it. Uh, um, Francoise Barry sinoussi one of the few women who got a Nobel Prize in medicine and, um, and um, uh, Luc Montagnier from uh, Institut Pasteur in Paris. Um, but it infected about 75 million people cumulatively. Again, very interesting to think because here we have a virus that spread through sex. Sex or blood products or from mother to child, but basically sex. It means that the 70 plus million people are infected are all connected with each other because they had either sex with each other, their mother had it, or they had a, an injection or blood transfusion. That tells also a story about human behavior what's going on and what we don't know, what's going on in the world. And, um, and that makes it double hard to deal with it. Also because there is enormous stigma associated with it, because it's associated with sex, and God forbid also with homosexuality. And um, so that made it very hard 
for governments to stand up. Now, India has done a really good job uh, when it came to um, dealing with, with, with HIV because the number of cases has uh, dropped dramatically in all states, uh, was particularly the South that was most affected. Um, and there was a worldwide mobilization. This is uh, the time my boss was Kofi Annan, and uh, the first debate of the UN Security Council was uh, of the millennium was uh, on, on AIDS. And um, it was something that I think the success was a combination of community mobilization involving people who were affected. And we didn't really judge anybody, whether you're a sex worker or a gay man or uh, you know drug user. It was to protect p uh, uh, the public at all. So there was a, a major uh, mobilization from uh, at all levels and driven a lot by people living with HIV who were the uh, civil society activists. Um, and that led to a, a real decline in new infections. Uh, as you can see, that started already in 1990. And then in mortality, when uh, antiretroviral drugs, so the HIV treatment, became widely available. And this is where India played a major and crucial role and continues to it. And actually, uh, a major part of, the, of people in the world with HIV, and there are about 20 million now on treatment, are treated with drugs produced here in Hyderabad. Produced with antiretroviral drugs, produced, uh, treated with drugs from here. Um, and, uh, and so we know for sure that um, if people, when you stop taking your medication, you die. So you should be proud that uh, Hyderabad business keeps 20 million people alive. That's the truth. However, <coughs> there is complacency. The number of new infections continues to be like a 2 million, it's not declining. And uh, in some parts of the world, particularly in the former Soviet Union, parts of China and so on, the number of cases is going up. There is this perception, it's done, we've got a treatment and uh, we don't have to deal with prevention anymore. Um, and so, whereas um, NACO, um, you know, the Na National AIDS Control Organization, was really an example for, um, like, other, not only in India, but for many other countries, um, I hope that it can continue its very important work, because we know for sure from other epidemics and other infectious disease, if you become complacent, it will go up. And this is certainly the case for something that is sexually transmitted. So don't believe people who tell you that by 2030 this will be over. Now, and then I'll go to the next stage, and that is that one thing that we've seen is that epidemics, they flourish when there is, you know, when there are humanitarian crises. Close to here, we've seen it uh, when there was the, the Rohingya from, uh, coming from uh, uh, Burma, from Myanmar, who uh, fled to Bangladesh, and there were major epidemics. You know, here in uh, Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh, these are all people who run away to save the, you know, for their life. Um, in the, from Myanmar, there were big epidemics with uh, diphtheria, uh, cholera, and so on. So that makes it double hard. So it's it's not just a medical problem; it's a societal issue. Now, what have all these issues, all these viruses, in common with each other? And the, uh, the answer is they're so-called zoonosis. They all have an animal reservoir. HIV comes from chimpanzee originally, Ebola from bats, uh, I mentioned um, SARS. Influenza viruses, they come and from various uh, animals, uh, particularly poultry and birds. And uh, that means that we need to think beyond humans when we try to find out are we ready for dealing with epidemics. And, uh, Whereas overall, and including here in India, the, um, the threat of um, infectious diseases is slowly going down, thanks to vaccines, to better sanitation, uh, the fact that you know uh, households here will have access to clean water, uh, will do so much uh, against enteric infections and diarrhea and save a lot of lives. However, because there are zoonoses, they're somewhere in nature, um, we will always have them. Of course, um, and that's going to increase. So we need to remain alert for these epidemics. Sorry, there is uh, urbanization, 
uh, international travel and mobility, climate change I mentioned, conflict, poverty, and so on, and then the food demand and population growth. So it means that we have to remain alert and be prepared. Now, what will the future bring? This is from a, a Belgian painter, René Bagrit, is looking at an egg and tries to paint a bird, what that may come out of it. What will the future bring us? Are we prepared? Now, after the epidemic in West Africa, uh, there were several uh, commissions, panels that were looking at uh, how the world and the countries uh, responded. And I co-chaired one with the was a London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine and the Harvard Global Health Institute. Um, we, that was the first report that came out. And we all came out with similar conclusions. One is that um, the world is not taking these epidemics seriously and is paying a very high price for it. Um, and that the first priority is that each country needs to be better prepared and needs to have systems so that at least one knows when there is an epidemic will start and by what it is caused. Secondly, the World Health Organization did an extremely bad job in the 2014. It failed completely uh, because of the bureaucratic response, politicized. Um, and uh, uh, so that is changed now, I must say. Um, and uh, so that was uh, one of the recommendations. Two, three, is that uh, this is not only for governments, but businesses, communities, people on the ground, uh, all have a, a major role to play and we need the trust of, of the community. And fourth, um, this is where there is so-called market failure. No company is going to make money with uh, developing a vaccine against Ebola or Zika, uh, Zika maybe, or, or Nipah, because it's occurring, uh, it's actually rarely occurring, so not huge markets, unpredictable markets, often poor populations, um, and yet developing a new vaccine cost hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so how to, and yet we need it. So this is where we need some new systems. Um, and uh, what is the situation? First of all, I would say that uh, uh, World Health Organization, WHO, is doing a better job now, and, uh, uh, and it was tested, and it is being tested in, in Congo, so it's more responsive with new director general and all that. So that's a... Uh, uh, and we need that. Um, two, um, more and more countries are um, getting ready, and there is now a um, epidemic preparedness index. Countries are assessed whether they are ready according to all kinds of indicators that I won't uh, go into. But um, India is uh, scoring uh, moderately well, but it, it, it highly uh, varies um, state to state. Uh, so many things. Um, thirdly, um, in terms of influenza, because my biggest fear is not Ebola, it is influenza. Uh, it's in some respiratory virus that will spread. Um, there is, a, and since 1952, so quite a long time now, uh, a network all over the world, including with laboratories here in the, uh, you know, in, in, in India, that are um, watching whether there are new viruses, new types of influenza viruses that could cause this epidemic uh, are being, you know, there's a good network for that. Also, very interestingly, there's now a global insurance system that was established by the World Bank. Um, and what is it? And what's the problem? The problem is that um, epidemics, when they uh, hit poor countries or countries that depend on tourism or trade, um, create a big political problem. When you declare uh, my country has epidemic excess Ebola, what's the result of that? Fly airports are closed, the flights are cancelled, uh, you're not allowed to export food, to export this and that and so on. So in other words, you not only have an epidemic, but in addition you're punished because you say you have an epidemic. And so the World Bank has created an uh, insurance mechanism together with some major global uh, insurance companies so that, a, um, that, that countries can take basically an insurance that um, says that um, when you declare your, that you have an epidemic very early on, you have access immediately to money to invest in dealing with this epidemic. And that mechanism was now triggered for the first time 
uh, for the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's managed by the World Bank. In terms of um, research and development, you know, something that can, is of interest to the university and a research intensive university as a, here at the University of Hyderabad, we established uh, with a number of people a, a mechanism uh, that's called Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation. It was um, the government of India, particularly through the Department for Biotechnology, played a major role in the establishment of this together with the governments of Germany, Japan and Norway, the Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust and a number of pharmaceutical companies, particularly JSK, Johnson & Johnson, Takeda, um, Merck, and uh, also some academic groups, and I chair the initial discussions. So I'm based on the principle that everybody who is part of the solution should be come in, the, in one tent. Now that's very unusual that you have government entities and, and businesses, particularly pharmaceutical companies and academia and NGOs, all together in one governance structure. That was not easy, there's not always the total trust, and we have have to manage conflicts of interest and so on. But nevertheless, I think this can be a new model for um, promoting, um, can be health, but can also to deal with all the pollution and environmental problems we have and what have you in agriculture and so on. And uh, so this coalition now brings together all these players. Money has been collected, about half a billion dollars. The government of India has announced last week that it is launching uh, CEPI as the abbreviation in CEPI uh, and that's uh, coming out of the Department of Biotechnology to, to support um, Indian research groups and uh, companies to develop vaccines where there is no commercial uh, interest. And that's also, if you want, an insurance mechanism but it's a, a, um, a push factor. and. Um, there are four priorities. One is finishing the Ebola uh, you know, um, vaccine development, but then developing vaccine for Lassa fever, which occurs in West Africa, here MERS in Middle East, Nipah, uh, South and Southeast uh, Asia. So this is where for, I would say we've seen for the first time that uh, India or an Asian country was actively involved in the setting up of a new multilateral mechanism that uh, also now can capitalize on uh, Indian know-how in the, um, you know, in biotech and in life sciences. And finally, can we predict where epidemics will occur? That would be nice, no? Um, and the answer is not really, but a little bit. This is where new techniques in machine learning and artificial intelligence and um, sophisticated um, surveillance of what's going on, not only in humans, but also in animals, in nature, because as I mentioned that these are zoonoses, uh, that one can, uh, you know, develop models uh, that predict where the highest risk is for occurring occurrence of certain um, epidemics. And this is a uh, filovirus, this is a, um, uh, based on the distribution of bats in Southeast Asia, but so we're more and more working on it and, and uh, using these new uh, technologies. Um, so are we better prepared? I think the answer is yes, because we have better diagnostics, we have better governance, politi some political commitment, but that goes up and down. We have insurance mechanisms even, financial insurance. Um, however, Compared to 100 years ago, we are now 7.6 billion people, soon 8 billion people on the planet, compared to only 1.9 billion in 1918 for the whole world. Um, mobility is huge. Tens of millions of people traveling, taking the plane. But we also have uh, uh, antibiotics today um, that would kill, uh, that would uh, uh, treat quite a few people because uh, influenza not only kills through the virus but also causes pneumonia which then develops you know into a bacterial pneumonia where antibiotics think. but what we need is a universal flu vaccine which has now been stimulated and will be part of a new um, research programs also here in this country now how do these epidemics compare to other problems and a, f a few weeks ago the world health organization published a list of what it saw 
as the 10 threats to health in the world, the 10 top threats. And uh, very interesting, uh, maybe a little bit less to, uh, for Hyderabad than uh, was at the beginning of the week in Gurgaon and in, uh, in Delhi, and I could hardly breathe, uh, and it was not really that bad yet, according to locals. But air pollution and climate change, you know, air pollution is killing far more people now than infectious diseases. We have the non-communicable diseases, diabetes and so on, that are affecting also India in a big way. We see influenza, we see then something that, what is AMR? Antimicrobial resistance, non-treatable infections. And um, whereas all this influenza, Ebola and dengue, they're, uh, you know, they're zoonosis, but not when it comes to, uh, here we have a man-made epidemic because of the overuse of um, antibiotics and of the misuse and the lack of infection control in many hospitals, we have now deadly untreatable infections. That's it. But also, interestingly, um, uh, another aspect that uh, uh, we don't uh, often think of in our today's world, we've reached a stage where vaccines have saved tens of millions of lives. We have all this technology. And yet now in many countries in the world, in 2019, um, you know, we see growing resistance and non-acceptance of vaccines. And so it's, the lesson of that is that it's not enough to have technology. We also need the confidence, the trust of people so that they will be used. And that's uh, um, now, according to the WHO, one of the big, um, you know, top priorities. And it results in something that we would never have thought possible. Last year, Europe had more measles. We thought that measles was eliminated than the whole of Africa. Why? Because of refusal of vaccines. And, uh, and, and that's, a, how to say, a paradoxical, if not absurd, situation where we are in an area of high technology, achievements of science, and then yet people refuse. And these are not uneducated people. They're often the most educated people in society. Um, so new uh, challenges for all of us. So to conclude, I think we're, uh, the world is in a better place, but we are still extremely vulnerable because of uh, the reasons I mentioned. And um, I, I think that uh, at the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine, our principle is that we need many disciplines to improve health. And whatever that takes, from a molecular biologist to an economist to a clinician to an anthropologist to mathematicians, we all have them in-house uh, because that's how we will make progress. And that's what also the university can make. And uh, uh, I st I'll end with an ad here for two of the books that go deeper into this on the one hand, a relationship between science and politics this, uh, and the pu uh, public trust, and on the other hand, the story of the discovery of Ebola and so on. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, very happy that uh, Peter has agreed to take a few questions. Usually distinguished lectures, uh, we don't, don't ask questions. But we're very happy that Peter has agreed to take a few questions. Uh, if somebody has a question, can you be loud, please? Yeah. You can shout. <laughs> oh, thank you, sir. First of all, I would like to thank you for such a great lecture, sir. So uh, my question is, uh, apart from uh, all these problems of poverty and uh, population, uh, do you think that improper and uh, like you know not a very good regulation and handling of the healthcare system in some of these African countries has probably contributed to the uh, such rapid uh, spread of uh, such uh, viruses like Ebola and others? Yeah, it's certainly true, and that's not only in uh, African countries that. Uh you know, if uh, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, one of the, the top priorities for dealing with epidemics is to have a system that we call public health uh, system. That means laboratories that can diagnose, you have surveillance systems and all that, knowing what's going on. And that's not there. And actually, also, this country depends on the state. Some states have really very good systems, 
or there's not. Um, and then uh, in terms of the um, uh, training of uh, you know all the healthcare workers and professionals, that's also very important. Yeah, I think that a healthcare system that takes care of all citizens is absolutely essential, not only to deal with epidemics, but it's probably going to be extremely uh, important to find good solutions when, uh, as a country, as a nation, we, you, everybody will have to deal with these chronic conditions. Uh, an epidemic that's short-lived, but uh, diabetes and hypertension and all that, that's, that's for life. You have to deal with it. How are we going to deal with that burden? In the UK, the National Health Service is really struggling because of this epidemic of combination of obesity, diabetes, hypertension, uh, alcohol uh, abuse and, and all that, mental uh, problems, uh, all in one. So your point is well taken. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, professor, uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor, uh, excuse me. Uh, professor, as a bioinformatician, I would like to touch upon the fundamental uh, 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 primary structure of uh, the epitopes of Zebo or Zerebello virus or uh, T cells or B cells or even AIDS because just last week I got the opportunity to meet uh, Cooper, the inventor of T cells, B cells at Anna University. And so uh, essentially it has been proven that uh, non-numbers are of significance either be it of core peptides or seed peptides because uh, anything less would be more uh, uh, random, anything more would be, anything less would be more uh, random and anything more would be more uh, stringent or, or vice versa. So um, uh, it has been beautifully established uh, using the big data genetic code I presented Polish Academy of Sciences that uh, uh, the Zebo uh, entropy maximum is 38.88 and uh, 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 it's equivalent with uh, Thomas Peterson's uh, 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 information content formula from DTU is 43.2. Uh, okay, okay, okay. yeah. So, yeah. Professor, uh, yeah, professor, I agree. Uh, so, Professor, the question is uh, 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 why uh, the, the maximum entropy has been uh, stipulated for these uh, epitopes, that is, as 38.88 uh, for the non numbers uh, 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 of the uh, uh, epitopes in the protein primary structure. Uh, uh, because because these so these works are proved. These have these works have been established at National University of Singapore and uh, Johns Hopkins University, and they also have a US patent on it. So, uh, yeah. sorry, I don't uh, understand the question. So yeah. it's a very we can talk about it. Can we oh. Yeah, yeah, we right. can talk about yeah. it. Yes. So thank you very much for a wonderful lecture. I have uh, to point out that uh, while uh, discussing the conflict part of the challenges to the public health, uh, not much attention is given globally to understand the causes and solutions for what can be termed as the governance in the regions of limited statehood. Right. And this is becoming more and more complex, getting less and less global attention. And I have a feeling that if you look at the history of these epidemics, they have actually originated in the first place in such zones of the globe. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, that's, uh, I write quite a lot about it also. But, um, and uh, let's put it this way. Um, Good governance is really important to, to deal with, I mean, health in general, but certainly with acute crises like epidemics. But viruses thrive on um, inequality, on um, corruption, on, um, you know, on, on conflict and fault lines in society, and, uh, and also on the vulnerability of people, because there's another aspect, and that is that uh, often stigmatization and discrimination are also making it very hard to deal with the epidemic. And I think their uh, HIV epidemic has been a, a, a very strong, a strong example. But certainly when you just take um, Ebola outbreaks, they're all occurring, uh, well, nearly all uh, in countries, as you say, sir. So I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, that's, again, why um, at our school we dealing with epidemics we not only have social science but also political scientists and trying to see what can not only to analyze but what can you do about it but there is a limit as academics what you can do because then you get into the real politics but it's a very important point thank you
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks. And thank you very much for taking your time out of your busy schedules. So uh, I thank the Dean, School of Life Sciences, for extending his support by providing this premises, which has state-of-the-art facilities. I thank you. I thank Professor Chamunagaru for having taken the initiative and all the effort to make this distinguished lecture happen today. Thank you, sir, and I thank all the faculty colleagues. I thank all the staff, the school scholars, the students, and some alumni who are present here today on this occasion. Thank you very much for your presence. I thank the press and the media and request them to give a wide positive coverage of these events henceforth. And last but not the least, I thank each one of you present here and thank you all for making this event happen in a successful manner. Thank you all.